Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty and our esteemed panel of housing experts for a discussion of barriers to renting, how discriminatory housing policies harm Americans. Today's webinar will be 60 minutes long. You'll hear in just a moment uh, from Janelle Fernandez, who will go over some housekeeping matters. Uh, but before we begin, I want to just quickly introduce today's presenters. Uh, the first is myself. My name is Tristia Bauman. I'm a senior attorney at the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. Also joining us today is Kate Scott with the Equal Rights Center, Eric Dunn with Virginia Poverty Law Center, Mark Chatton with Catholic Community Services of Western Washington, and Jith Meganathan of the Western Center on Law and Poverty. Hi everyone, this is Janelle Fernandez here at the Law Center. Just wanted to go over a couple of quick housekeeping items with you that you can um, use to enhance your webinar experience. So we will have uh, just a couple of minutes for Q&A at the end of our webinar session. You can submit your questions throughout the webinar through the questions box in your uh, go to webinar toolbox and that's highlighted there on the screen for you. We probably won't have time to use the verbal question option where you raise your hand, but please do submit your text questions throughout the session. Um, just another note, today's presentation is being recorded and we will post the video online and share a link to the video as well as a link to the um, PowerPoint slides with everyone later this week. And back to you, Tristia. Thank you very much, Janelle. Uh, I know that our webinar attendees are at least somewhat familiar with the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty, uh, but to give some quick context uh, to this conversation and also some background on our, our organization, we are a nonprofit organization located in Washington, D.C., and we are the sole national legal organization dedicated to preventing and ending homelessness. An important part of our work is raising awareness about the solutions, enduring solutions to homelessness. Uh, what we all know and what the data has made clear over time is that housing ultimately is the solution to homelessness. And there are a number of efforts undergoing uh, now to provide housing to homeless individuals. Uh, some of those efforts have been targeted at certain subpopulations like homeless veterans or chronically homeless individuals. Uh, but all housing solutions should uh, be mindful of the and designed for uh, the different barriers that may not be immediately apparent that affect homeless people and people at risk of homelessness. And so today's topic is uh, barriers to rental housing. Uh, the vast majority of people who are currently homeless or at risk of homelessness are low-income renters or formerly low-income renters and will in the future be low-income renters. And so looking at barriers to rental housing is key when we consider what sustainable solutions to addressing homelessness may be. First, the size of the homelessness crisis in this country. Uh, we have a sizable crisis. According to HUD data, uh, and that is uh, conducted uh, in a single night in January 2016, where at a single point in time, homeless individuals are counted, there were 549,928 people counted in the January 2016 point in time count. It's uh, widely recognized that the HUD count is an undercount of the homeless population for a number of reasons. And there are other indicators uh, of the size of the homeless population which suggests that even that sizable number uh, does not represent the, the full size of the crisis. For example, data from the U.S. Department of Education suggests that as many as one in 30 U.S. children are uh, now homeless or will experience homeless over the course of a given year. Also, it's estimated that nearly 8 million people are living doubled up with friends and family uh, in uh, housing. And that's uh, uh, an increase of 67% since the inception of the foreclosure crisis in 2007. 
Uh, in that same time period, we have seen an increase in the number of severely cost burdened rental households. Uh, when we talk about severe cost burdens, uh, burdens, we're referring to households that pay over 50% of the total household income on housing. Uh, for our purposes, that would be the cost of rent and utilities. There there are now over 11 million severely cost burdened renter households, uh, meaning that these households have less than 50% of their income to pay for other of life's necessities like food, transportation, childcare, clothing, medical costs, uh, leaving uh, that many people and more um, very vulnerable to homelessness if a single thing goes wrong. And again, uh, there's been a tremendous increase since the inception of the foreclosure foreclosure crisis in 2007 uh, with the cost burden, uh, number of cost burden households increasing by 73% since 2007. Uh, some of the reason uh, for the cost burden, of course, is the rising cost of housing. Uh, from 2007 to 2015, the median gross rent has increased by 6%, while at the same time, the median income for renter households has only risen by 1%. And for all households across the nation, uh, it, the uh, <clears throat> median income has actually declined by 4%. And this is all uh, data from the recently released out of reach report for 2017 by our great partners at the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Uh, some of what has contributed to housing rental costs are the historically low vacancy rates. Um, and so what we know is that there are few units for a great number of people who need them. When someone is in housing, it's important to protect their security of tenure and prevent unnecessary evictions. But it's also important for housing advocates, of course, uh, and homelessness advocates to think about barriers to housing re-entry once someone has lost their housing. Uh, so we have a great panel of experts that will talk about a number of uh, discriminatory housing policies that serve to bar people from re-entering into the housing that uh, may otherwise be affordable and available to them, uh, further worsening the housing crisis, keeping people out uh, on the streets and shelters or in substandard housing, and uh, directly undermining some of the efforts that are being made nationwide uh, to address homelessness specifically like rapid rehousing programs. So with that context, I am going to turn it over to our first speaker, Kate Scott at the Equal Rights Center, who will talk about barriers to housing access uh, for survivors of domestic violence. Kate. Thank you, Tristia. Uh, so I was asked to speak today about um, housing barriers for survivors of domestic violence and how it could be possible for housing advocates to use a fair housing approach in order to overcome some of those barriers on behalf of clients um, who are survivors of domestic violence and also in terms of thinking about local advocacy efforts um, that can be implemented in, in order to expand those protections for survivors. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I am the deputy director of an organization called the Equal Rights Center. Um, we are a civil rights organization, nonprofit that's based in Washington, DC. Uh, we have various program areas, uh, including housing, employment, and public accommodations. Our housing program is uh, bifurcated both locally focused and uh, we do national work as well. Um, our public accommodations work, um, disability rights work, employment work tends to be more national in focus. Um, I came to the ERC about two years ago. Um, before that, I worked for a long time in New Orleans, actually, at the Fair Housing Center there. Um, so I say that in order to provide some context. Um, I think in the wake of the last election cycle, we've all been hearing a lot of advice to go local. And to me, as a person that came from a red state, that feels um, pretty overwhelming, even though I'm currently working in a place that has some of the most progressive housing policy in the country. Um, so I'm hoping to include information in this presentation that is relevant even to those of us uh, that are still working and uh, trying to protect people's rights um, in areas of the country where that's even more difficult than it is um, in a place like Washington, D.C. Um, next slide, please. 
So I would imagine that most folks on the call already know that domestic violence is a leading cause of homelessness. Uh, this is a infographic that I took from a website called domesticshelters.org. Um, you can see there that approximately 50% of all women who are homeless report that domestic violence was the immediate cause of their homelessness. Um, and when you look at homelessness amongst women and families with children, um, it's a really big problem. Next slide, please. So when Tricia asked me if I would participate in the webinar, um, there were a couple of different options for topics on the table. Um, and I proposed that I limit my comments to thinking about a fair housing approach in situations where folks are interacting with survivors of domestic violence. Um, and there's a really important law in place of the Violence Against Women Act um, that protects the housing rights of survivors of domestic violence. Um, but it has some key weaknesses, and uh, that's why I would like to propose that folks think about um, also incorporating a fair housing approach in this work. So um, a short discussion of some of those weaknesses. Um, VAWA is limited in an enforcement sense. There's no private right of action, and there's no ability of an entity to obtain damages as a result of a violation. Um, also, fair housing laws cover more housing than VAWA does. Um, it's likely that if you're working with um, homeless populations that um, are survivors of domestic violence, they're going to need affordable housing, and it's likely that that affordable housing is, is federally funded and therefore covered by VAWA, but that's not the case in every instance. And the key with fair housing laws is that they cover private housing in addition to federally funded housing. Um, Another thing that's important um, that fair housing protections offer is that the range of relief is really broad. And so um, Tricia's comments focused on preventing discrimination against people when they're re-entering housing, but there are actually some forms of relief in the fair housing context that can be used to keep people in housing. Uh, for example, temporary restraining orders, um, lease bifurcation, um, and in some places where there are specific protections, fair housing protections for victims of domestic violence, um, early lease terminations are another option. Um, finally, I would note that with Fair Housing Act cases, you have access to federal courts rather than agencies or state courts. Um, so many states have state court systems that are hostile to civil rights. In Louisiana, for example, we never filed a fair housing case in state court. That would have been a joke. <laughs> um, also, post-November 2016, um, we know that federal agencies like HUD and DOJ are in turmoil, and what I'm seeing on the ground right now is that they're, they're slow or they're non-responsive to civil rights items. I think over time, we can expect them to become more hostile to civil rights claims. Um, and so right now, at least, the federal court system in many places offers the best possibility of relief um, in civil rights cases. Next slide, please. So with fair housing laws, there's basically two theories of discrimination. The first is differential treatment, and that's intentional discrimination um, in a housing-related transaction or interaction that's based on an individual's membership in a protected class. So for example, a landlord tells an interested tenant that they don't rent to families with children. That's an example of differential treatment. The second theory is disparate impact, and that's a policy or practice that's spatially neutral but has a different effect on a group that's based on their membership in a protected class um, without a substantial legitimate business justification. Um, so an example of that is actually a case uh, right now that we have, we filed in the district against a housing provider who would not accept Section 8 vouchers. And our claim is that that has a racially disparate impact on African Americans in the district. Um, so that's an example of how that works. I'm going to give another example further on in the presentation, but those are the basic concepts that I think it's important to understand. Next slide, please. So I imagine many of you already know this, but the protected classes under the Fair Housing Act are race, color, religion, national origin, sex, familial status, which is the presence of kids under 18 in the household, and disability. Um, and one note on the sex protection is that there's some recent case law indicates, that indicates that um, sex can cover gender identity too. So 
Uh, these are the seven federally protected classes. There are lots of locally protected classes in different jurisdictions across the country, but there are also ways to think about some of these coverages uh, more expansively than they were first imagined when they were added to the law. Next slide, please. So in thinking through how there can be fair housing protections for survivors of domestic violence, um, I wanted to point to this February 2011 memo from HUD. Um, it's actually guidance to HUD investigators about how to assess claims of housing discrimination against survivors of domestic violence or by survivors of domestic violence. Um, so first off, it points to this issue of direct evidence. So if a housing provider states a policy that they don't want to rent to women with a history of domestic violence, uh, because they always go back to their abusers, for example. That very clearly, this memo says, violates the sex protection of the Fair Housing Act. Um, but then it also outlines the basis for a disparate impact case involving domestic violence. Um, and it cites some statistics there. So for example, in 2009, women were about five times as likely as men to experience domestic violence. Um, the memo goes on to state, these statistics show that discrimination against victims of domestic violence is almost always discrimination against women. Thus, domestic violence survivors who are denied housing, evicted, or deprived of assistance based on the violence in their homes may have a cause of action for sex discrimination under the Fair Housing Act. The memo also points out that these statistics can be applied when you think through um, race and national origin discrimination as well. And there is a caveat in the memo um, that says that they recognize that men also experience domestic violence, um, but because of the wide disparity in victimization um, and because many of the Fair Housing Act claims will be based on the disparate impact of domestic violence on women, um, that that's the focus of this particular memo. And then it also points to typical types of um, Fair Housing Act domestic violence cases, uh, specifically eviction, and transfer cases and gives several examples of those cases from around the country. So I think it, it could be really useful um, in thinking through um, this particular aspect of your work. Next slide, please. Um, so this is an example of a disparate impact case using that theory. Um, and this was brought by the ACLU Women's Law or Women's Rights Project. Um, based on something that happened in 2012. I know this case settled in 2014. There's a lot more information about it on the ACLU website. Um, but it came out of Norristown, Pennsylvania, which had an ordinance that penalized landlords um, and encouraged them to evict their tenants when the police were called to the property a certain amount of time for uh, quote unquote disorderly behavior, which included responding to incidents of domestic violence. These type of ordinances are pretty common across the country. And so what happened was that the plaintiff in the case, Lakeisha Briggs, um, was threatened with eviction after she called the police on her abusive ex-boyfriend. Um, and she became really reluctant to call the police because of that. And she you know, decided that it was worth it to try to survive the violence that she was experiencing in order to avoid eviction. Um, to the point that in 2012, when her boyfriend attacked her with a brick and she uh, was walking down the street bloodied um, and on the verge of passing out, her neighbors finally called the police on her behalf and she was airlifted to the hospital. After that happened, the city threatened her uh, with eviction. Uh, so the ACLU brought this case um, and alleged that um, the ordinance had a disparate impact um, on women uh, based on the, on the Fair Housing Act. And um, like I said, the case settled, I think in 2014, um, Northtown had to remove the ordinance from its books and then also paid um, a settlement to Ms. Briggs. Next slide, please. So that's, um, you know, the disparate impact theory is something that's really important to think through, but it also, in this instance kind of requires you to do some contortions under the law in order to make the case. Um, there are also many places that have local protections um, on behalf of survivors of domestic violence. Um, so I'm gonna talk through two of them very quickly in order to get you thinking about, you know, whether or not these exist where you live um, and also to think through whether it might be possible to get them in place. 
Um, so the first I'm going to talk about is uh, the DC Human Rights Act. Um, this added status as a victim of an intrafamily offense in March 2007, and it's probably one of the strongest of these laws that exist in the country. Um, unfortunately, the regulations um, implementing this protection have not yet been promulgated by the Office of Human Rights in DC, but I've seen a draft of those regulations, and they go so far as to stipulate reasonable accommodations um, based on survivors having credit and criminal history that's related to the violence um, that's per, uh, perpetrated against them, such that uh, they might be able to, um, you know, alter the credit and criminal history screening requirements of housing providers. Um, in addition to the overall protections that are included in the Human Rights Act, which really mirror the Federal Fair Housing Act, um, it also bans refusing to make re a reasonable accommodation in restoring or improving security and safety measures beyond the housing provider's duty of ordinary care and diligence. Um, it uh, outlaws refusing to permit a person to terminate the lease on the premises early when they're experiencing violence. Um, and it also explicitly bars um, limiting the right of a person to call for emergency assistance. Um, so the next law that I want to talk about is actually one that I worked on getting passed in Louisiana. Um, and that's to say, uh, you know, these, it's great to be in DC. It's really exciting for me because there are all of these progressive protections, um, but it's actually the DC Human Rights Act is what we looked at in Louisiana to model a policy there um, in order to pass some explicit protections for survivors of domestic violence. So the Louisiana Violence Against Women Act was passed by the Louisiana legislature in 2015 after it failed to pass in 2014. Unfortunately, I was not working on the law when it actually passed. I only got to work on it the year that it failed. Um, and what it does is it extends some VAWA style protections to survivors of domestic violence statewide, even those that are living in private housing. So it allows for things like lease bifurcations. Um, it explicitly allows survivors um, to contact emergency assistance without penalty. And it states that survivors can't be denied housing based on a history of abuse. Um, I think it's a really important example of a policy level of policy victory at the local level. Um, it was based on an eviction case that came into the Fair Housing Center that I worked at, um, in which the client's uninvited ex-boyfriend beat her until she needed to be hospitalized. And when she returned home, um, there was an eviction notice on her door based on a provision in her lease that outlawed all illegal activity on the property. And so um, in lobbying for this bill, we really led with a message about um, how domestic violence is a leading cause of homelessness for families and how that's very expensive for the state of Louisiana. We also led with a really business friendly message around um, making sure that the law is the same across the board, regardless of what kind of housing provider we, you are. Um, in 2014, the Apartment Association lobbied at the last minute to kill the bill and they did it effectively. Um, their messaging was around don't play, don't ask, you, we shouldn't ask landlords to play the judge and jury in these cases. Um, and that was effective, but with a sustained campaign, we were able to go back the next year and get the law passed. All right, final slide. Um, so these are just some additional resources that I thought it might be useful for people to have access to. There's a link there to the DC Human Rights Act. Also a link to the HUD memo that I covered. Um, there's a link to a toolkit that the ERC released earlier this year. Um, there are some interesting connections between the proclivity of domestic violence survivors to have a criminal record related to the violence. Um, and so this toolkit provides some pointers for consumers about how to overcome criminal record screening policies. Um, and then there's some links to some of the important cases that the ACLU Women's Rights Project has worked on um, that I think are applicable to this um, topic. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kate. That was fantastic. Uh, and uh, please uh, write in your questions that you may have for Kate and that we'll get to at the end of the webinar. Right now, we will move along uh, to Eric Dunn, who will talk to us about criminal records. Eric, take it away. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Janelle, could you advance the slide uh, again? And one more, please. 
If you can't, okay, there it goes. Um, okay, so it's probably everyone on the call has heard uh, multiple times before. Criminal records is really one of the kind of key civil rights issues of our time. Um, it's estimated that close to 78 million people as of 2014 had some type of criminal record on file with the FBI. I've seen estimates as high as 100 million Americans having some type of criminal record. Uh, that equates to between about one third and one fourth of the adult population of the country. Can we advance the slide, please? So um, criminal records are something that you know affects a, a huge number of people. Um, and if you look more closely at what these criminal records are for, um, you know, it's clear that the, the drug war and the, the problem of mass incarceration, um, you know, really stems from that. Uh, almost half of people in federal prison are, are there for drug-related offenses, you know, primarily nonviolent drug possession offenses. Can we advance the slide again? And of course, one key aspect of the criminal records issue is that um, it is primarily people of color, especially African Americans, who bear the brunt of uh, the problems that criminal records cause. Um, if you look at these two graphs, uh, the red bars represent uh, basically white people and the black bars represent African Americans. The top graph shows the rates of marijuana use between 2001 and 2010. And you can see that the rates were about the same for both white and black uh, individuals. And the bottom graph shows um, the rates of arrest for marijuana possession charges uh, during those same years. And as you can see, um, your chances of being arrested for marijuana possession were, were far, far higher if you were African American than if you're white, even though uh, the rates of, of marijuana use were about the same. Um, so this is one of the reasons uh, that you know, we'll see huge disparities, huge racial disparities uh, throughout the criminal justice system in terms of arrests, convictions, incarceration, and so forth. Can we advance the slide again, please? Um, nationally, African Americans are more than six times uh, more likely than whites to have uh, a criminal record uh, despite you know, committing offenses at similar rates. Um, and if we could advance the slide again. Um, so this is certainly something that causes problems uh, in just about every walk of life. Um, you know, not just housing, um, but since, you know, we're concerned about housing today, um, you know, we'll focus on that. Uh, as you can imagine, many rental housing providers adopt policies that um, treat people with criminal records less favorably than applicants who do not have criminal records. Uh, sometimes that means, um, you know, denying admission to them altogether. Um, could advance the slide. Um, those types of policies, policies which treat uh, rental applicants less favorably based on having a criminal record, um, can violate the Fair Housing, and, uh, Fair Housing Act uh, because of the disproportionate effect that they have, uh, especially on African Americans. Um, I could advance the slide one more time. As Kate talked about, um, if you have a uh, a policy that doesn't overtly discriminate against people based on their membership in a protected class, but it has a statistically discriminatory effect on uh, members of a protected class, um, then that policy is unlawful unless it is justified by a substantial legitimate interest on the part of the housing provider. Um, furthermore, there can't be some equally effective alternative by which the housing provider could fulfill that objective uh, without you know, we're causing less of a discriminatory effect. So if we can advance the slide again. Um, you know, as we saw, African Americans are, are more than six times uh, as likely to have criminal records as, as white people. And those statistics um, seem to hold true, uh, not just nationally, but, but through, you know, most if not pretty much all, uh, you know, more local jurisdictions where people have looked at this. Uh, it's fairly easy in these cases to meet the first prong of the disparate impact analysis, showing that policies which treat rental applicants less favorably because of criminal records have a discriminatory effect. Um, but uh, you know that doesn't automatically mean that those policies are unlawful. 
um, it is possible for landlords to justify those types of policies. So what um, what sort of justifications will landlords offer for uh, screening out people with criminal records? Um, it's probably the ones you might expect. Landlords will say that people who have criminal records might be dangerous. They might threaten the health and safety of the other tenants or neighbors or uh, property management staff or other people in the community. Um, the people with criminal records might cause property damage or um, engage in, in you know, criminal activities on the premises that, that could uh, you know, be harmful. Um, and, you know, those are probably uh, going to be, you know, legitimate concerns, at least facially. But, you know, the issue really comes down to, uh, is it necessary to screen out, um, you know, anyone with a criminal record or, or large categories of people with criminal records? Um, you know, because of these concerns, and you know, the answer is basically going to be no. Can we advance the slide again? Um, you know, presumably there are some types of crimes and, and some people with criminal records who might legitimately be dangerous, but not everyone. And so, um, HUD in a guidance they issued uh, last year, uh, and this is consistent with what you know, fair, fair, advocate, fair housing advocates, you know, generally presumed to be the case um, is that uh, some crimes have nothing to do with rental housing or some crimes have nothing to do with, with someone's fitness for being a tenant, fulfilling the terms of a tenancy. Um, some crimes may have had some relevance in the past, but the person may have re rehabilitation or um, changed in, in certain ways and it's no longer predictive. Some crimes are directly related to things like mental illness or substance abuse problems from which the person may have been treated and recovered and doesn't present a threat any longer. Um, and so it's not necessary for landlords to um, screen out people because of criminal records when those records are no longer uh, predictive of what kind of tenants they'll be. You can advance the slide again. Um, another key factor uh, that some, and if you could advance it one more time to bring up a little circle. Um, now, one study has shown, for instance, that age is, is potentially the, the most predictive factor in terms of whether someone who's committed a criminal offense in the in the past, at least um, someone who was you know, an adolescent and late teens committed an offense, um, that by the time they reach their mid-20s, if, if they've been able to remain crime-free for about five to seven years, their likelihood of reoffending reaches the same level approximately as someone who's never committed a crime before. Um, advance the slide again. Um, other studies have shown you know, different types of, of, of rates suggesting that anywhere from about four to seven years uh, for different types of crimes, um, that if someone's remained crime-free, that, that they're, they're no longer likely to present a heightened risk of, of committing an offense. So um, one of the aspects of the disparate impact analysis is that landlords may not simply rely on um, speculation or just sort of uh, offhand theories about who they think is, is you know, dangerous, um, but their criminal records policies actually need to be supported by um, you know, evidence and uh, so forth. So we can advance the slide again. So in, as I mentioned a moment ago, uh, last year um, in April, HUD issued a guidance, um, and this is, was directed not only to, um, you know, subsidized housing providers, but but even um, to, you know, private landlords uh, concerning the use of criminal records in screening for rental admissions. Um, and if you practice in this area, it's something that you certainly uh, want to be familiar with, but um, there are really, I think, three key takeaways from the guidance. Um, one is that if landlords are going to be using policies that treat people less favorably because of uh, criminal records, that they need to be relying on convictions or um, you know, at least have some you know, uh, basis for establishing that the person actually committed the crime. In other words, um, that if landlords are, are screening people out based on dismissed arrests, um, that there's probably not going to be an adequate justification for that type of policy um, under the Fair Housing Act. Uh, second, that when landlords use um, overly broad policies to screen out people for criminal records, um, you know, the, the term blanket ban, uh, sort of an offhand word that's used to describe policies that might exclude anyone with any kind of criminal record or 
large large swaths of people such as no felonies or um, no crimes within seven years, uh, things like that, where the landlord really isn't making any kind of um, nuanced determination as to which types of crimes uh, and so forth are are relevant to um, you know what, what they think of acceptable tenant would be. Uh, the third key takeaway is that HUD does recommend landlords make individualized determinations, meaning that um, if someone has a uh, criminal record that the landlord um, thinks, you know, it makes that person an unacceptable risk, um, and the landlord ought to look at the individual circumstances of that applicant and see, you know, what exactly was the crime, how long ago did it occur, uh, is there evidence of rehabilitation, et cetera, and make kind of a case-by-case -case decision as to whether to admit that person or not, rather than just having a one-size-fits-all policy. Um, can we advance the slide again, please? So despite this HUD guidance having come out um, last year, uh, could you advance it one more time? Um, we continue to see uh, policies that would uh, directly conflict with the main points in the HUD guidance. Uh, this is an example of a Craigslist ad that, that I found uh, just recently. Um, I'm fairly confident that I could find one of these ads uh, most parts of the country um, anytime I wanted to. Um, this one it says clean criminal background is required, which I interpret to mean you can't have any you know, convictions, you can't have any arrests, you can't have anything on your criminal record, and it doesn't matter what type of crime or how long ago it was, uh, you would not be accepted at, at this type of property. So I think what this speaks to is um, that even though uh, we have the HUD guidance and um, you know fairly favorable case law uh, around this this issue um, to advance the, the disparate impact theory on behalf of people denied housing for criminal records, that there's a real need for enforcement and for people to uh, be bringing cases based on uh, these types of denials. Which leads me to my next slide, if you could advance it, please. Um, probably the, the best example of an enforcement case based on, on this issue going on right now is, is one in New York City um, that Roman Dane Colfax is bringing against the Sandcastle Towers, which is a large uh, apartment complex, over 700 units. Um, in a part of New York, New York called Far Rockaway, um, which uh, is alleged to have had a, uh, a blanket ban not allowing anyone uh, to move in there um, who has any kind of criminal record, uh, regardless of the type of crime or, or the circumstances of the age of the record. Uh, so that'll be an important case to keep our eye on. Um, if we could advance the slide again. Um, one, one of the Great things I think about the Sandcastle Towers case is that it um, presents a, a good model for how um, the disparate impact theory can be used to challenge some of these blanket exclusionary policies that landlords have. Um, when we look at unlawful detainer or eviction records, um, you know, traditionally there have not been the same kind of statistics available uh, to show who gets sued for eviction like we've had with criminal records. Um, but through you know, some recent studies, especially the work of Matthew Desmond, um, it's become quite apparent that uh, African-American women, especially single mothers, tend to face eviction at significantly higher rates uh, than other types of households. And so that um, you know, could provide a, a viable disparate impact cause of action on behalf of African-American households, uh, female-headed households, uh, tens of children, to challenge uh, fairly common practice that landlords have of denying admission to anyone with any kind of eviction or unlawful detainer record, um, again, irrespective of the outcome of the case a lot of times. Even if you won your case or, or you know, it's dismissed, and that may still prevent you from getting housing. You can advance the slide once again. Um, so there's, there has been one of these cases uh, recently filed um, in uh, the Western District of Washington. Uh, full disclosure, I'm one of the lawyers on that case. Um, but a researcher in, in that case has found that um, African-American women in King County are sued for eviction more than six times uh, the rate of white men. Um, so a fairly similar statistic to what we see with, you know, at least nationally with, with criminal records um, that, you know, more than six times. Um, and so this is a case that challenges a landlord have, from having a, uh, a blanket, you know, categorical ban, not, not running anyone who's ever been sued for eviction regardless of the circumstances. Um, so again, this will be another uh, disparate impact case. I think that will uh, potentially have some 
you know, show how this, this area of law is going to develop. I think that's my last slide. Yeah, I, I think I'm out of time, so I think I'll, I'll skip the errors on the background check. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, just a reminder to all of the listeners that the uh, slides, a recording of this webinar, as well as links to all of the resources that are discussed in this webinar will be included in a follow-up email to all of the participants. So you will get that information. Uh, I will make just one note that uh, as we think about the effect of criminal records uh, for those who are working on housing advocacy, Advocacy on behalf of homeless people. Uh, when you think about the legislative advocacy that you're doing, um, whereas some of the arguments that have been laid out um, by Eric can be helpful, uh, it's also important to remember that homelessness itself is not a uh, protected status under the Fair Housing Act, and there are an increasing number of laws that uh, can result in criminal convictions for people based on their homelessness. I'm referring to uh, laws for uh, that target, for example, sleeping out of doors, camping out of doors, sitting bans, loitering bans that are disproportionately uh, enforced against homeless people. Uh, for more information about the criminalization of homelessness, how that can lead to increased numbers of criminal records for homeless people and the barriers that that can impose to their housing access, uh, you can uh, find that information on the Law Center's website. Switching gears slightly, uh, but uh, looking again at barriers particularly ones that affect renters in Washington state that have a direct uh, undermining or that directly undermine uh, homeless rehousing programs like rapid rehousing. I'll turn it over to Mark Chatton. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay. Um, good day, everybody. Um, I am the director of uh, legal services at Catholic Community Services, but the main program I work with is the Legal Action Center, which is funded to provide legal advocacy to low-income tenants who are facing evictions or housing and subsidy terminations. And a lot of that has to do with the um, um, funding to prevent homelessness. Um, but as a side role and an unfunded one, we had been providing limited representation to tenants who had past debts to landlords that were creating barriers to the tenants finding suitable housing. Uh, obviously, debts uh, to prior landlords can be um, used as a criteria for denying applications. So it was important to try and make sure that these debts that were being alleged actually had some merit. Um, in most of the cases, we'd use the Fair Debt Collection Practices Act or the Fair Credit Reporting Act to um, request uh, proof of the debt and in uh, debt collection actions, um, ask the um, debt collector to no longer contact the client directly to only contact us. Uh, next slide, please. Um, once a debt was verified, uh, then we would attempt to negotiate a lump sum payment or some kind of settlement uh, that was reasonable. But the reality is most of our clients are extremely low income, um, probably 50% are disabled. So they're surviving on SSI. And these debts um, really were um, not things that could be settled given their limited financial resources. Uh, on occasion, we might have a client who uh, was uh, getting a tax return, and we could use that as a lump sum payment to pay off um, the debt and hopefully then remove the barrier. But for the most part, the Legal Action Center had been um, providing just really a buffer between the collection agencies and uh, the tenant, uh, again, most of them being disabled, just to have that so that they weren't being harassed by landlords provided some benefit. Um, next slide, please. Now, in the context of public housing and Section 8 vouchers, this becomes a lot more difficult. Um, as most of you would know, um, debts to former landlords or to public housing authorities can be the basis for termination from the program, either be uh, evicted from the public housing uh, unit itself or have their Section 8 vouchers terminated. Um, 
this is a, a, a huge problem in King County. Um, one of the biggest populations we have that we're serving are uh, Section 8 voucher holders who cannot lease up for a variety of reasons, uh, including that they have past debts on their um, credit history. Um, we are advocating for tenants whose vouchers are being withheld because a landlord submits a claim for damages. The best example I have right now is a mother, African-American with two children, has a Section 8 voucher, but that voucher is being held by the housing authority because the landlord submitted a letter after the client moved out that said she owed $12,000 in damages. Um, I've requested uh, receipts from the landlord showing that there were actual damages and that they incurred these costs. Uh, I have not received anything. The housing authority has not received any verification of the debt beyond this letter that just says she owes me $12,000. I've asked them what proof they have. Um, they have pictures, a uh, broken window, a cabinet that looks messed up, you know, stuff that happens, um, but nothing that would amount to a $12,000 debt. But they're holding the voucher and that voucher will eventually expire. Um, next slide, please. And they're doing this without giving us a formal hearing process because they're saying it's not a termination, um, that they're just holding it. Um, but in fact, eventually when the voucher expires, then um, the tenant will no longer have a voucher. We're meeting with um, some of the other organizations in King County that have the potential to use litigation. Our office is only uh, funded to do defense work. So situations like this where we need to um, enforce our clients due process rights, we turn to um, some of the larger organizations here in King County. And we happen to be very lucky to have a resource rich county um, with massive housing problems. Another debt that comes up that can be very difficult to resolve are tenants who vacate public housing owned housing. Um, we've had cases where uh, the um, housing authority will find six or $7,000 in damages. When you get a breakdown of it, um, a, a good example was at one hearing, there was $600 for replacing blinds. I did a quick analysis of the blinds. It's like $180 to buy four sets of blinds. How come it's 600? And the housing authority um, representative testified that they pay their um, staff union wages. So I think there's a cost analysis there that would show that they're not paying their employees that much, but there is no res resolution except maybe to litigate it. And again, there's not a lot of opportunities to litigate damages to um, public housing properties. Next slide, please. So with um, our past experience being mainly just protecting disabled people from harassment, um, we noticed also that in the context of, place, uh, of, of times when we had a possible payment plan or a lump sum payment, we were hearing from collection agencies, we're not going to negotiate on those terms anymore. Why don't you send them over to X, Y, or Z, which has a rapid rehousing program? So the dynamics for negotiating had changed. And rapid rehousing, and most of you probably know, is a strategy to rehouse homeless households as quickly as possible. And oftentimes they will do that by locating a prospective landlord who will rent to this homeless family so long as a debt on their tenant screening report to a prior landlord or a judgment to a prior landlord is resolved. Um, if the resolution is uh, completed, then the um, homeless family will be able to apply for the apartment and will be approved. Next slide, please. Now, this, all, uh, this good intentions always results in unintended consequences. And landlords and collection agencies now know there are large pockets of money available to pay off debts and judgments to past landlords. And the fact that 
there's very little in the way of prevention dollars to prevent people from becoming homeless. Um, coupled with the potential of this payout, um, I think many landlords now are seeing or are incentivized to go ahead and proceed with evictions, especially when you know that it's a very vulnerable family, because you may hit a payday if this family gets into rapid rehousing. They'll pay off the judgment, and if you throw on a couple thousand dollars of debt for replacing carpet or whatever, a lot of times they'll go ahead and pay that. And there's not really a checks and balances on this. In its current state, and especially in King County, which is the only place I really have that much experience with, it amounts to a pretty massive transfer of financial resources from nonprofits to collection agencies and past landlords. Next slide, please. Well, there, this does create an opportunity, both for rapid rehousing programs and legal services programs that are dealing with homeless issues. Many of these case managers are not, have not received training on the issues around debts and judgments. Many of the judgments are paid, but the case managers are unaware that a satisfaction of judgment needs to be filed. And then collection agencies, knowing that these folks really aren't trained, are sending um, obsolete debts, debts that are over seven years old. Um, I've seen one that came across with a 10-year-old a, a debt, and they were going to pay it until I mentioned that it's no longer collectible. Next slide, please. So after a couple of years, the strategy, tenants who were housed in the initial um, start of the rapid rehousing program may be relocating now, and they're finding out that those judgments are still on there. And because the judgments are still on there, prospective landlords are refusing to rent to them, even though they can provide some evidence that the debt was paid. Collection agencies, credit reporting agencies look to the court files to see if those judgments are satisfied. And without a satisfaction of judgment, it's still going to be a barrier. Now, we started working with our rapid rehousing program at this agency. And I also conducted a pilot project earlier this year um, in the hopes that I would get funding for this. And I found that these problems exist across the system. Uh, several programs came to me with satisfactions of judgment that needed to be done. Some of them were uh, other issues. And there's, the legal issues that arise out of this doesn't just involve, hey, get me a satisfaction of judgment. We have all sorts of issues that come out, um, including it, like when a judgment creditor is deceased or it was a, co a corporation and now that corporation is disbanded. How do we deal with that? How do we resolve this? Um, and then just making sure also that the landlords we're renting from are complying with the Residential Landlord Tenant Act. Now, what I found is uh, in this short period of time that I've been doing this work, that working with the landlord tenant bar, if there's an attorney on the other side and it's a judgment, I can resolve that very quickly. And it's one of the pleasures of my job to have somebody from Rapid Rehousing come down and say, I've got a problem with this case and I get on the phone and solve it in five minutes. That goes to show that this can be a very productive relationship. And um, the second part though, is collection agencies, working with collection agencies. We've got to figure out a way to deal with this uh, satisfaction to judgment issues because they tell us, oh, it's 30 to 60 days until we'll file the satisfaction of judgment. And that doesn't work for uh, rapid rehousing because that means that judgment is still there for another 30 to 60 days. The whole point of this was to get people back into housing as quickly as possible. So given that there are um, probably a lot of programs out there, rapid rehousing programs, that aren't getting any kind of legal assistance or advice on how to handle some of these more complex issues, um, I'm encouraging legal services programs, if you have a robust rapid rehousing program in your county or city, to contact them and see if they are getting some of this, these uh, issues resolved, or if not, um, propose that you be included in their next contract. That's what's been happening for my program. Um, despite the fact that we have a housing crisis here in Seattle, 
uh, getting prevention dollars for lawyers to stop evictions is incredibly challenging. This offers an opportunity um, where there's m much more funding available and we can show that we there are ways to make the use of that funding much more efficient and effective. And that's all I have. Thank you very much, Mark. We are now uh, about just a few minutes from the end of our scheduled time, uh, but we are turning it over to Jith Meganathan, who will discuss uh, eviction ceiling, which obviously is a very important issue. I'd invite everyone on the call to stay over for a few minutes. Jith has around 10 minutes or so of content, and for those willing to stick around, uh, we do have just a couple of questions that I'll pose to the speakers. So please feel free to stay with us for another 10, 15 minutes. Jith, thank you. Thank you. I'll be as brief as possible. Uh, I am a policy advocate at the Western Center on Law and Poverty in California. Uh, I focus mostly on legislative and administrative advocacy in Sacramento. Um, the issue of uh, tenant blacklisting through uh, tenant screening reports is uh, an issue I think in every state in the country and I just want to describe um, a successful reform effort uh, that we were able to enact last year. Next slide. Next slide, please. Okay, so tenant screening reports uh, identify individuals who are named as defendants in an eviction lawsuit. And while the existence of tenant screening reports uh, altogether is a problem. One of the uh, major problems that we see is that mere involvement in an eviction lawsuit is sufficient to lead to blacklisting. It's not just folks uh, who, who lose an eviction lawsuit against whom an adverse judgment is entered. The tenant screening companies go to every court in our state every day and write down the names of every defendant um, who's named in those cases and uh, there are at least seven of these services in California. Landlords who subscribe to these services uh, screen prospective tenants against these lists, and they therefore effectively function as tenant blacklists. And what happens is that the applicant is either charged an exorbitant security deposit in order to rent, or simply denied the opportunity to rent altogether, which leads to homelessness particularly in a state that um, has a housing shortage and rents as high as California does right now. Next slide. So in trying to reform the current state of affairs, we ran up against two major constraints. The first is that uh, Tenant screening reports are governed by the Federal Fair Credit Reporting Act, which has two significant consequences. The first is you can only challenge the accuracy of the information in a tenant screening report. That is, if you were not actually named as a defendant, uh, you could challenge your inclusion in these. And we've seen cases where um, tenant screening companies were so overzealous that they were writing down the names of tenant attorneys um, and recording them in blacklists. So those attorneys were able to challenge uh, the accuracy of their inclusion since they weren't actually named as defendants. But people who were named as defendants uh, could be listed. The second is that the fact of the eviction lawsuit can be reported for up to seven years after a lawsuit is filed. So this um, once you're on such a list, you, you stay on there for seven years and it has devastating consequences for that period of time. Next slide. The second constraint that we faced is that um, under California law, the information that was disclosed in a tenant screening report uh, became subject to First Amendment protections so that 
we were we were not a successful in challenging the ability of tenant screening companies to publish information once it entered the public record through court records. But the court that decided the case that I'm citing here helpfully said that if the state is concerned about dissemination of this information, it has the power to control its initial release. So any legislative solution that we were attempting had to focus on what information was gonna be disclosed in court records. Next slide. So the way that the law existed prior to the bill that we ran, AB 2819, records were in court, records in eviction lawsuits were initially sealed for 60 days. At the 60 day mark, courts would look to see whether a tenant had prevailed within that 60 day mark. And if they had, the records would remain sealed. But if they had not prevailed in that time, the records became public. And this is the way the law had been for about 25 years from the early 1990s. Uh, that was the last time that we had attempted to reform this law. Uh, at, prior to that, everything became public on day zero and all defendants were screened out regardless of how their lawsuits went. There were three consequences of this. The first is that there were um, zombie lawsuits that were leading to blacklisting. Essentially, the landlord would file a lawsuit, the parties would work out their differences, uh, or the landlord would decide not to pursue the case, but the landlord never dismissed the complaint. On day 60, the lawsuit would become public and the tenant defendant would become blacklisted even if they remained in uh, that housing. The second uh, was that this had a chilling effect on um, many tenants' willingness to pursue meritorious defenses. Uh, our courts are very congested here in California. And if you were um, to litigate a defense and potentially go to trial, you might edge out past that 60 day mark and end up blacklisted even if you won your case. Um, and that um, goes to the third point as well. Uh, because of court delays, uh, the tenant may have decided to pursue their meritorious defense, but prevailed after the 60 day mark and ended up blacklisted as well. Next slide. So after a lot of work, we were able to pass this bill, AB 2819, so that in as of January 1st, um, 2017, records are initially sealed on filing in eviction cases. And now the landlord has to obtain a judgment within 60 days of filing the eviction lawsuit for the records to become unsealed. Alternately, if the landlord prevails at trial after the 60 day mark, um, the judge's order specifies that the records are to become unsealed and the records can become public in that case as well. Otherwise, the records remain sealed. So essentially what we hope we achieved here is that only people with adverse judgments um, or who lose at trial after the 60 day mark, only their records uh, will become public. Next slide. So a lot of things had to go right for us to pass this bill and I'm just gonna briefly run through some of the, the key ones. The first is um, we had to work with the judicial branch in order to ensure that this bill wouldn't insure, incur any fiscal costs, um, which would have increased the chances that it uh, either wasn't uh, approved or that the, our governor would veto it. So working with that 60 day mark that was in the prior law was key and it, uh, the courts concluded that it would not require a great deal of reprogramming of their systems in order to accommodate this law, and therefore it was not tagged with a fiscal cost. The second, uh, I know this is easier said than done, but um, we engaged in almost five months of negotiations with the landlord lobbyists before we were able to get at least some of them to go neutral. The key was that they wanted to reduce the number of trials um, particularly in 
there are a few jurisdictions in California where every tenant has a right to a lawyer under our um, Sergeant Shriver um, Civil Access to Justice pilot project. And they felt that the provision in the bill that said that if the tenant lost at trial after the 60 day mark would uh, reduce the incidence of um, tenants taking matters to trial perhaps if they did not have meritorious defenses. And they felt that that was enough um, of a win for them that they were able to go neutral on this bill. A third thing we did is that we simultaneously ran a much more controversial bill, um, in this case, a voucher uh, non-discrimination bill. This was not intentional, but as a side effect, many legislators who otherwise probably would have voted against this turned to the, the landlord lobby and said, look, we, we already dealt tenants a blow by defeating the voucher non-discrimination bill. I think we're going to give them something with this. Uh, fourth, we frame this as a credit reporting reform bill, not as a tenant protection bill. And that was something that people were able to uh, relate to much more because a lot of people have had errors on their credit reports that um, made their lives more difficult. The fifth is we found an amazing charismatic uh, victim of blacklisting um, who was not at fault for her eviction. Um, I, of course, everybody, um, Nobody should be harmed by tenant blacklisting, but again, framing is everything in legislative advocacy. And in this case, the tenant, uh, her landlord had uh, filed an eviction lawsuit. She had a meritorious defense, and then the landlord was uh, foreclosed on, so she never had an opportunity to present her defense and ended up homeless um, for a long time uh, with her six-year-old daughter as a result of this blacklisting that she had no control over it at all. And she literally brought some legislators to tears when she testified. Um, finally, we found um, victims and allies among veterans groups and labor groups, and um, they were able to appeal to particular legislators uh, for their support. So those were all important strategies that worked in our favor. Next slide. So that concludes my presentation, but I'm happy um, to answer questions here or follow up with me afterwards. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jith. Uh, this is Tristia Bauman again. Here's my contact information. I know that there are a couple of short poll questions that Janelle Fernandez will be asking the audience members to help us ensure uh, the quality of the content that we present to you in our webinars. Uh, I'll ask the speakers to stick around just for three questions, uh, which should take uh, maybe another five minutes or so after we complete the uh, survey questions. Thank you everyone for joining us and for sticking around to hear the answers uh, to the questions. Janelle? Thanks, Tristia. So uh, thank you to everyone who has stuck with us through the webinar. Like Tristia said, we just have two really quick uh, survey questions that we would like to ask of you. Uh, the first is, as a result of this webinar, do you have a better understanding of the topics that we've discussed today? Uh, the options are yes, a lot, yes, a little, or no, not really. And if you could, please just go ahead and click right on the survey question on your screen and let us know if you found the material that was presented today helpful to your understanding of these topics. And I'll give folks just a few more seconds to, um, to log their answers. If you haven't responded yet, please go ahead and just click right in that survey uh, window on your screen there. All right, so let me close this poll out and I will share these results with you. And it looks pretty good. So 62% of you said yes, this was uh, a lot helpful. 37% yes, a little and just 1% no, not really. So thank you to everyone who responded to that. And we have just one more question. Let me share that with you. And this question is, will you use the information that you learned today in your work or advocacy going forward? Your options are yes, no, or not applicable. So one more time, if you could just respond to that polling question by clicking right there on the screen. Um, this will just help us 
know how helpful this information is and if it's being put to use and help us design future webinars to be helpful for you as well. So I'll give just a few more seconds for folks to respond. Okay. And this is great. 100% of you that responded said, yes, you will be using this information in your work going forward, which is fantastic. That is what we love to hear. So thank you all for responding to those surveys, and I will pass it back to Sia for some Q&A. Thank you. I really appreciate everyone sticking around. Just a couple of quick questions. Uh, first, uh, for uh, both Eric and Mark, who worked on Washington State's law that allows for limited dissemination of unlawful detainer records. If uh, you can talk maybe first, Eric, about uh, what that law does, maybe a, a couple of points about the strategy that was used to uh, get that law to pass. And then I'll turn it over to Mark to talk a little bit about how it is functioning in practice since enactment. <clears throat> I, I believe there's a slide on, on that one. I don't know the number, but it deals, it's the one involving RCW 59.18.367. Um, you know, if you're able to find that and pull it up, it'd be great. But um, basically, I thought just presentation was great because a lot of the things that he recommended were things that, um, you know, had happened in, in Washington as well. Um, the uh, way that this law works is um, it allows uh unlawful detainer cases to still appear in the court record system so the public can find them but the court may enter an order on behalf of a defendant in an unlawful detainer case providing that that case is to be of limited dissemination and if the court enters that order making the case of limited dissemination as to one or more of the defendants then a tenant screening company is not allowed to report that case to a landlord uh, in a tenant screening report dealing with that that defendant. Um, and, you know, we would love to have had a California style law that simply sealed the records from the public's view altogether. Um, the reason the California approach is kind of superior is because, uh, you know, one of the one of the shortcomings in the Washington law is that if you have a landlord who um, looks up the applicant himself or herself uh, using the court systems database, um, you know, they'd be able to find the record of the case. Uh, it, it, this only limits what tenant screening companies can report. Um, so, you know, the California law, which, which you know, the public can't access the information, um, you know, provides even better substantive protection for tenants. But in Washington, uh, as in some other states, um, in fact, Washington has a state constitutional uh, provision which provides for the open administration of justice and that extends to open public access to court records. And what that means is that in order to limit the public's access to any kind of court record, uh, even you know, someone's name in a judicial database, um, you, have to, you have to meet a very ex exacting uh, strict scrutiny type test. Um, so we'd actually attempted to do that in a couple of lawsuits, and we had some limited success. Um, but eventually, there was a case in 2015 called Untoft versus Encarnacion, and we lost four to four to one with the uh, majority, or I guess plurality, actually uh, ruling that the public's interest in access to eviction records uh, was was more important than protecting tenants' ability to get housing uh, when they were wrongfully sued. Um, and in fact, the majority even started off their opinion by saying that uh, our clients in that case had, uh, you know, had a valid lease and had done nothing wrong to deserve being sued for eviction. So um, you know, it was a really tough, tough loss, but we did get some favorable language in a footnote in that plurality opinion, which said, well, the legislature can uh, do something about this. And so it, that kind of provided us an opening to get this limited dissemination law. Um, another uh, constraint besides the, well, I, I, you know, it's just explained in California, the contents of a tenant screening report are considered to be um, ordinary speech subject to the First Amendment, you know, again, under a strict scrutiny analysis. In most of the country, uh, any kind of consumer report, which would include a, a tenant screening report, uh, is considered commercial speech, and so it's subject to a, a 
less rigorous uh, analysis. So if the state imposes restrictions on what can be reported, you don't have to survive strict scrutiny. It's something called a central Hudson analysis. So we didn't have to worry about that constraint. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the other things we had going for us, um, you know, we, we did have a number of, of tenants who had, you know, very unfair eviction records who were able to testify. Um, we were also running other legislation that was more far reaching. Um, for instance, we had uh, bills that would have created something called a portable tenant screening report so that you, you pay one screening fee and a report is created about you and then you can shop that report around to different landlords um, for a 30 day period without having to pay another screening fee if you get turned down somewhere. Um, and landlords didn't like that. So uh, this was something that, you know, they, they felt like they were going to eventually have to agree to something and they could swallow this. Um, so I'll, I think I've probably gone on longer than I should have. So I'll turn over to Mark to talk about how that law is working in practice. Um, well, actually, Eric, your, your timing was perfect because um, the law in uh, his, you know, we're just really working out the kinks, figuring out what are the grounds for limited dissemination. Um, our office has not been able to jump into the fray with that, um, although it definitely is something that we should be um, filing on behalf of our clients. Uh, at this time, we just really haven't had many um, opportunities to do so. The one case I am aware of that um, did get an order of limited dissemination um, is an African-American mother with children, um, and she continues to find that um, landlords are, um, as, as Eric says, they're going on their own in looking into SCOMAS. I think vulnerable households have to expect that they're going to get a higher level of scrutiny for uh, those kind of um, those screening reports. Um, and and for the most part, most evictions will not qualify for limited dissemination. So its impact right now, it's hard for me to say that it's having much of an impact. I'm still working through that process and seeing cases that have gotten limited dissemination orders, but still are finding difficulty in finding housing. And that's what I have on that. Great, thank you very much. Uh, switching gears, talking about strategies to get information, once a law has been passed um, and or even in the absence of a specific state statute, uh, the application of the Fair Housing Act, for example, to some of these blanket screening policies, are there any strategies that the presenters have used to get information about the legal problems related to blanket screening policies uh, to landlords? Um, and how should those strategies be uh, adapted in large cities versus smaller rural areas? And that's for everyone. Just, yeah, this is Kate. I just want to make sure I understand the question. It's what are the strategies that any of us have used to get information to landlords about yep. blanket vans being problematic? Yes. Um, so the toolkit that I mentioned that the ERC published earlier this year, one of the recommendations that we make for people to consider is that they provide their landlord with, a, if they are rejected based on a blanket ban, that they um, explore the idea of providing their landlord with a copy of the HUD guidance that Eric referred to. Um, you know, that is something that we try to make clear is, you know, up to the decision of the individual tenant. But for a lot of folks that have criminal records, they're being turned down in lots of different places at the same time. Um, we interact with people who have no interest in living in a place once they've been rejected. Um, but we also interact with some people that, you know, really want the unit. And so um, we have had some success um, with tenants providing a copy of that guidance. Um, we've also talked about the idea of um, our intake coordinator sending something like an advocacy letter the same way we would in a reasonable accommodation or reasonable modification situation to a landlord um, because sometimes, you know, something coming on official letterhead from an agency that people know is involved in litigation can help. Um, so I don't think that that's something that should be uh, 
discounted. And, you know, I can't say that it works in 100% of the cases, but it's an option. Um, some of the things that uh, I've been involved in, um, you know, when I was in Washington, uh, the Tacoma Fair Housing uh, Office and also uh, another organization in Seattle um, would put on landlord like trade show type things, conferences, and they would invite um, fair housing advocates to speak sometimes. And so I would give presentations to them. Um, a lot of times they were pretty hostile uh, crowds. They didn't want to necessarily hear what I had to say, but um, you know, you could at least put this issue in front of them. Um, when I was in Washington, I, I had an article published in the state bar magazine that goes to all, learn, all attorneys called Rental Housing's Elephant in the Room, basically pointing out that it looked like um, landlords that were using these blanket no evictions policies were probably violating the Fair Housing Act. And the only thing we didn't have to prove it was the, the data. Um, and uh, that article had, had been recirculated in, in the landlord publications and so forth. So um, I think that may have been helpful in getting some of their attention. Um, and then with criminal records, uh, the organization I work for now, the Virginia Poverty Law Center, um, we're working on uh, a report that we're going to send out to um, subsidized uh, housing providers and to low-income housing tax credit prop properties in Virginia, where we've basically analyzed their criminal records policies and are pointing out how we feel like there's not a very good, uh, you know, not very good compliance with the HUD guidance in terms of their criminal records policies, and hopefully that will, um, you know, get some of them to reform their policies, you know, for fear of enforcement. Great. Well, thank you uh, for those responses. I think those are some uh, very helpful ideas for how to get at the landlord audience. Uh, we are unfortunately uh, so far over time that I don't think we can get to the remainder of the questions. Thank you to all of our panelists for the great information that they provided uh, to us today and to all of you who have joined us for today's webinar. Please do feel free to contact the Law Center with any questions that you may have about our work generally or about the content of this webinar. You also will receive, as I mentioned earlier, an email with the links, the webinar recording and the presentation uh, and uh, the uh, materials that are referenced in today's webinar are uh, all going to be in included there as well. And I'm sure our presenters um, would, would welcome your questions about their presentations. Thank you everyone and have a great day.